when I thought about um, somebody coming on for the new year, um, I thought about you and I thought, hey, Minister Jean. Ooh, what's up, woman of God? We can't hear you Woo-hoo. because you're, you're, your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> it is good to see you. <laughs> also, this is Minister Jean. She's uh, calling, chiming in from Connecticut. Wonderful. Nice yeah. to meet you. So, um, to meet you as well. That's so we appreciate you. Thank you for coming on, Minister Jean. We appreciate you. It's been a rough month. I'm <laughs> telling you, right? It's been a rough what month, is, but God is good. <laughs> Yeah. She, um, it was her husband I was talking about earlier, Apostle, that right. is going through the right. rehab and you know, getting better mm-hmm. and stronger. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you, Jean, for being on tonight. Appreciate yes, you. You're welcome, sir. Love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Apostle, tonight, um, again, when I was thinking, you know, to bring somebody on, I thought about you because, um, just a little that you had spoke with me those few times, you know, it really impacted my life and. Um, I want to, I wanted to bring you on so that everybody could meet you first of all. And, um, because I often talk about people that have impacted my life and, um, has poured into me or shared something and anything I have, I share. (laughs) And so, um, I thank you for being on tonight. You have been a blessing. Each one of these ladies, um, have been a blessing to me in my personal life. Um, Pastor Janet, and Lady Womack, uh, Makala, um, that we've known each other from England, from England. Yeah, we kind of like grew up in the same, you know, same time, same church, same ministry. Her father is a a well-known bishop in England. Um, He's he's passed away now, but he is just a prominent figure in England uh, for all the black churches, Caribbean churches. Everybody knows of Bishop T.A. Makala, and this is his daughter. Um, Lady Patricia, that's on, you know, we've been walking this thing out for, for years. We, you know, we've lost, we lost kind of touch when they moved here to America and I was still in England, but, you know, I came to America and, you know, we just happened to end up in Georgia. <laughs> Ooh, wonderful. I left Connecticut and came to Georgia and we reconnected and, you know, and then Pastor Jay, um, Pastor Janet is also, um, been a prominent uh, figure in my life. You know, I've known Pastor Janet from, you know, 14, 15 year old. <laughs> and so she, you know, we, I was going to her house for to eat, to sleep there. You know, she was wearing my sweaters. I mean, that's how we brothers and sisters, you know, we, we just tight. <laughs> and her sister, you know, is also deceased also, but they have impacted my life. Um, uh, Elder Stacy. Uh, from the time I met her a year ago um, through this Zoom, um, she has also been a blessing. Uh, she, when she gets a rocking, you got to watch out because you know that Ooh. prophetic word is coming. That's the rock. <laughs> from <Ooh. Elvis> Stacy. <laughs> and then last but not least, Minister Jean. I mean, we have others that may join tonight. I don't know, but um, this is the nucleus right here. And Minister Jean, um, the church that I uh, was an, a member of and also one of the elders, the assistant pastors at uh, Minister Jean for 15 years. We were in ministry in Connecticut over 15 years. And um, mm-hmm. so Minister Jean is, she's just a family member. You know, my wife, we love her. She has done so much for us uh, throughout the, our lives and still is pouring into us. And uh, so we just appreciate uh, Minister Jean for being on tonight. So um, <clears throat> so the panel that I'm amongst, um, uh, uh, Apostle um, these women are serious women of God. They, you know, they love the Lord. Pastor Janet um, is pastoring, you know, uh, last year, I think she got the, um, the, the call to pastor and then here comes COVID. So, <laughs> you know, it's been a, um, a roller coaster ride, but, you know, the Lord has been good to her and her, uh, her um, husband is also helping pastoring and, you know, Elder Stacy up there in Chicago. And so, you know, these are women of God that um, I respect. You know, I, I don't hang around foolishness, Apostle. I really don't. <laughs> and I don't have time for it. But, you know, these women have impacted my life. And so we, we came together last year. I think it was like uh, the end of March to April. And we started this um, Thursday night uplift. And we've been going ever since, ever since last year. Um, the Lord has been good to us. He's spoken to us many times. We've got revelation. We've got inspiration. We've got anointing. I mean, sometimes we can't, we just worship. I mean, the, the presence of the Lord is so, 
you know, like fills the room <laughs> that we can't even minister anymore. And so there have been those times. And so um, when I say I look forward to this, I really do because it's helped me um, throughout my process and my journey as well um, to this point. And so I thought this new year, <clears throat> um, as you have impacted my life last year, just, you know, that conversation, I never forget it, Apostle. I was walking Stone Mountain. I was walking and you mm -hmm. called and we, <laughs> we started to talk and um, you know, you, it's like the Lord just revealed my life to you as you, as we were talking and the very books I was reading, you just started to name them. And I'm like, Lord, what is that? <laughs> Don't reveal nothing else to him, Lord, because <laughs> no, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but Hey, if, if I need to have it, I need to have it. I, you know, the Lord, what, uh, he chastens those that he loves, right? So, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I, 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 so I respect you, sir. And through um, Bishop Kevin Chung, um, he kind of connected us together. So I did ask him, you know, to join us later if he gets a chance. Um, but I really thank you, sir. So um, I, I don't have a, um, an agenda. I just have um, some questions. But if there's something you want to share right now, sir, um, you can, and I'll just chime in with the questions a little later. <laughs> it, it's up to you. Well, very briefly, I, I just want to speak from my heart, even as God has deposited something within it, uh, that I feel strongly would be a blessing to us um, at this time of quite abnormality uh, with the quarantines and the stay in place and the uh, different strains of the coronavirus. Yeah. Um, I had shared with you and I'm sharing again for the benefit of those wonderful women that are on the line <clears throat> that I've just met. Um, before going into seminary, I was in a pre-med program um, pursuing an MD and a PhD simultaneously in research medicine. And, you know, as I told you, um, we had a, a what, what we would call it, a, a lab-related accident within the organic chemistry lab at the time. And a lot of people got their mucous membranes damaged and um, I came out quite fine, nothing really. And while waiting for the lab to be refurbished and, you know, to resume our studies, God spoke to me and told me that he wanted me to pursue ministry and not medicine. So, and not to do it simultaneously either, much um, to my excitement because I was trying to multitask and do both, but he said no. I said not to say this, in this time of the pandemic, I have been called upon to be with Morehouse School of Medicine and Emory um, Medical School and you know other um, research centers within the Atlanta metropolitan area to address the COVID-19 situation because of my training and because of what I've done at Morehouse School of Medicine Clinical Research Center. Um, you know, they had asked me to partake in a kind of a community-based educational campaign to help people understand the vaccine and, you know, whatnot, and especially people in a minority um, population um, who are quite skeptical and for good reason. Uh, of the medical institution here in America. Well, <clears throat> I said all of that to say this. 
while praying about a lot of things, God mentioned to me that I should share what I'm about to share with us tonight. We are men and women that love God. We are anointed to preach, but sometimes we forget that we are, and I'm glad that, that we have the preliminaries before this, and it really encouraged me what I heard. We forget our humanity. We forget that, yes, we are spiritual beings. Yes, we are anointed. Yes, we are called, but we are still human. We have a soul, a mind, a body, and the spirit. So um, we need to realize this more. Believe it or not, we are dealing with some psychological impactment um, with this pandemic. You've mentioned that one of the pastors that is on this platform this evening received the call to ministry last year. I think it was uh, Pastor Jackie, right? Janet. Janet, Janet, you say I'm wrong. Uh, Pastor Janet. And what happened? Here comes the COVID-19 pandemic. Here comes the stay in place mandate, the quarantine style <laughs> stay in place mandate. The Bible says, and this is a simple thing that I, I, I wanna share, that we should not neglect the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Much more so as we see that day approaching. Um, we read that scripture in the past and we say, yeah, you know, it's true, you need to go to church. But we didn't pay much attention to it. The reason why it's there is because we are multi-parted beings. We are not just spirits. We are spirits with souls, minds, and living bodies. If we do not have fellowship, if we do not come together physically, Zoom is good. Skype is good, YouTube platforms good, all of these things are good. But God has miraculously and meticulously made us to be social beings. And when you do not engage in socialization, you begin to experience some social and emotional deficits. You begin to show telltale signs of not enjoying socialization. <laughs> and that's where I'm going. Um, we have a situation where here in Atlanta, we have mega churches, um, several of them. And because of the size of the churches, it gives people the impression that the churches are more blessed because they're bigger. And it causes people who have medium-sized churches and smaller churches to feel inferior to mega churches. So you could imagine my surprise when I received a telephone call from someone who is at the helm of a mega church here and wanted to speak to me. And I said, fine. And I said, we can speak right now, I'm free. And he said, no. I don't want to speak to you on the phone or on Zoom or Skype. I want to see you face to face. I said, well, you know, I, 
I'm shocked because I don't know you that well. I, I know you from television and I know you from all these, but um, you know, a lot of people heard about me. And I'm not surprised you call me, but um, why you want to see me? The person said to me that they have thousands every Sunday, but they still feel alone. And they have a lot of people who gather around them in the ministry from all over the country and all over the world, but they still feel alone. Then they said something. They said they cannot discuss what they want to discuss with me with these other people because there is a trust issue. And I say, well, how come you feel you can trust me? Because I, <laughs> I never, you know, I don't know. They said to me that they heard someone telling them about me. And they said that I am known for confidentiality and I am not, and this is what they're saying. I am not um, greedy for money and I don't steal churches from people. So I said, well, yeah, you know. And he also met with him. And he said this, he said, before the pandemic, my marriage was terrible. But now that the pandemic has come, I am not able to be busy with the ministry because it had to be shut. I'm on Zoom from home. And that's the problem. My wife is at home and I am at home and I am forced to be in this woman's presence. I don't have, I can't run to the church. I don't have an excuse to say I'm going here. I gotta stay in it. He said he got an apartment. Wow. He rented an apartment, lives in a huge home, rented an apartment because he is planning to leave his wife. He can't stay another day in the house with this woman. And I say, well, you know, th this is simply a symptom, but there's a cause, something long and short. He was getting his fulfillment from a crowd of people. Yeah. And from a group of leaders whom he didn't know nor do not trust respectively. But when forced to stay home because of the pandemic, he found himself not happy with the person that he was married to. One of the pastors tonight said that we shouldn't, at a wedding she was told that we shouldn't just love the person, you want to want them. And that's what triggered my saying what I'm about to share today. He did not want his wife. He said to me, and, I, and I'm trusting that I'm talking to people who are real. <laughs> yes, sir. He said to me, Apostle, I do not want to cheat. Now you gotta understand, this man has a large church, everybody thinks he's Jesus. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sitting there in this, <laughs> in this uh, restaurant, and I say, well, you know, sir, I know you said you don't want to cheat, but you left off a very important word in that sentence. That word, is by part is, is two two words two words actually anymore <laughs> anymore mm. 
And he said, yeah. And I said, you know what we're dealing with? We are supposed to assemble ourselves together as we worship God. And those of us who can't assemble ourselves anymore with a congregation, with other leaders, are feeling detached. If we had a healthy assembly, but if we have an unhealthy crowd, you know, we're going to be looking for satisfaction elsewhere. And if we got a bad, a, a bad what we call arrangement, not a marriage, but an arrangement, we're not going to be able to be fulfilled. And what I want to, I just shared that as a segue. What I want to say tonight is that we need to want our spouses, not because they are the associate pastor, not because they are the head of the elders board, not because they're the minister of music or the church administrator but because there is something in them that we cannot find in a congregation, we cannot find in a, a, a leadership board, and therefore we don't just love them, but we want to be in their presence because it's important for our emotional health that we be in a relationship with someone that we don't merely like them, like how they look, like how they talk, but there is an ingredient, a personal ingredient within their lives without which we cannot thrive. We cannot grow. We cannot be fulfilled. So therefore, we have a strong desire to be with them. So with that, it is time for us in this pandemic, as we are with our spouses, some forcibly, others delightfully, that we learn more about them and garnish, you know, them with love and embellish them with our affection and then gather from them some pertinent gems that make us grow in our appreciation for them. Because I believe, the, from my experience, the biggest challenge in ministry is not church planting, it's not church growth, it's not church management, but it is relationship management where we need to have healthy relationships. And the best ground that we could use as a place to develop healthy relationships is within the relationships that we already have in the form of marriages. If we can learn to appreciate our spouses, learn to love them, learn to want to be with them, look forward to their being in our presence, it will take us to another level of relationship building and relationship appreciation. And so I think the pandemic is, could be used in that sense to our advantage. And um, so, as I said, it's a brief sharing. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of what God had, uh, dealt with me about with, with um, the gathering together. But before we can gather together with the assembly 
of the people in the local church. Let us learn to appreciate who we are already attached to, our spouses. And there's so much we can learn from them and so much they can learn from us and so much that we can benefit and grow from being cognizant of our being integrally attached to them. So thank you for allowing me to share this brief dissertation. <laughs> also, you said a lot there. <laughs> um, I was just trying to take some notes as you were speaking. Um, hey, Bishop Kev, thanks for joining in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bless you guys. Apostle Owen, bless you. Good to see you. Yes, sir. I just thought Amen. it might have God. Bless you. Bless you. I just thought it might have been a nice surprise for you to see possible here. That's why I didn't tell you. <laughs> I had a feeling he was going to be on there anyway. <laughs> okay. God. God. Uh, Bishop Kev, uh, Apostle, I'm going to get back to what you're saying in a second. Bishop Kev, um, we have uh, Lady Patricia um, in Georgia with myself, and then Minister Jean is from Connecticut. Uh, Pastor Janet, you know, you, you get, do you guys, you guys know each other, right? Pastor Janet. <clears throat> Uh, you mean Janet that we used to roll with with the yeah. singing in New York? Yeah, yeah that's uh, Pastor. Uh, that's Pastor Jay. Yep. Amen. Hallelujah. From you, look at from, you. from Chicago. She's in Chicago. She's in Chicago. Um, oh, coal up there. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Elder Stacy, Elder Stacy Jackson is also uh, from Chicago, as well. Bishop Kevin is in Virginia. Virginia, right, uh, Bishop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead. Does, does anybody want to um, say anything based on what the Apostle Owens just shared? Um, I mean, before I say something, I mean, I, I could start it off. <laughs> I think it kind of goes in line with something that we had discussed a, a little while back and we were talking about the pandemic and we were talking about, you know, one of the things that people are going to have to grapple with or they found themselves having to grapple with is when they close the door, now they have to hear their own voice. Whereas they were busy doing everything else before and they didn't have to hear their own inner voice either. They didn't have to hear, um, didn't have to kind of feel the, the disconnect that was maybe happening in their own homes because everybody's busy doing everything else. But now, <laughs> since you have to be together, you can't ignore your own voice and you can't ignore the dysfunction or the disconnect that is right there. So definitely it falls in line with something that we talked about a little while back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like the fact, thank you, Pastor Jay. I like the fact that you talked about um, our humanity, because that's the first thing you started with. And I think um, a lot of us are, have become, can you hear me well? Because I know I'm having some trouble yeah. with this. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. I know that a lot of people are, you know, in this pandemic you know we have a lot of voices a lot of everybody has a prophetic word and everybody is everybody gets spiritual but we forget the human human side just like the the uh, pastor you just referred to um you cannot be so spiritual that you're you know you forget the human human side of you you know as pastor jay shared i just wanted chocolate <laughs> You know, there's nothing spiritual about that. It's just human. It's, <laughs> it's okay to want something. And I think sometimes um, we forget that um, we are human. God made us, you know, you just talked about that um, body. You know, these bodies are human um, and we are human and we need to feel, we need to feel love. We need to um, share. We need to feel a togetherness. And um, just like you talked about the um, pandemic, it, you know, the, forsaken of the assembling of the brethren i know a lot of people are traumatized because now we can't come back together because you know that's where we felt a sense of belonging but since the pandemic a lot of people have either left the lord <laughs> because they can't deal with it anymore or they can't they don't know how to work the technology for zoom they don't know how we we did a um a call uh last year about technology and how the church um, is was far behind this Zoom technology. Mm -hmm. It's only since the pandemic we kind of got hit, you know, we kind of got with YouTube 
and Zoom and, you know, we started to use it. So we were already behind, you know. So a lot of people, um, Apostle, to your point, um, I think that is either going to do one thing. We're either going to get closer to God in this season and, you know, closer to our spouses, closer to our children, you know. But they say that it's been the most divorces that's happened. Yeah. It's happened during this pandemic. <laughs> yeah. The most separations and, and because people are not, you know, used to being in the same space as that pastor you just shared. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, it, but it reveals what's already been dormant, though. That's right. That's exactly. right. It's, only, it's only revealing what has already been dormant. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we again, remember we've talked about this, we keep pushing things under the Holy Ghost rug. With, you know, <laughs> Holy Ghost rug, but I, like I say, even if it's a even if it's a grain of sand, and you keep pushing a grain of sand on the piece of rug, soon enough you're gonna buck your toe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you, Pastor Jay. I think um, a lot of us have been psychologically impacted, as you said, um, Apostle. Um, it has caused you know a lot of psychological stress by not being able to. Get to get. I can't, you know, imagine that a pastor that loves the sheep, but you can't touch the sheep. You can't be amongst mm -hmm. the sheep. You can't, you know, dwell with the sheep. Be, you know, so it, it's got to be hard, you know, and reaching them by Zoom is good, like what we're doing. But as you said, it's not up close and personal like you mm -hmm. want to, you know. So, you know, it's got to be hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. That, but that. could it also be that um, ministers, pastors spend more time concerned about the sheep than they do about their homes and their spouses? And so what, what happens is they become married to the church. And then the wife, if it's the man, uh, the wife becomes married to the children because she doesn't have a husband, so to speak. And so the relationship structure begins to change. And then that, that like Pastor Janet says, it becomes exposed when... A situation like a you know COVID nineteen a pandemic shows up, then it shows where your mind is, where your heart is, and what relationships you're depending on. So, yeah, I, I like what Apostle said. It's very important that if you're married, that you make sure that relationship is good, yeah. because the church can come and go. You people will come and go, and you know you put a lot of confidence in people, and people are people. They're still flesh, and so. It's important to build relationships with what you want to last. Amen. That's good. But as we, we also learned too that the the structure of our lives being as we're social beings is that is God, the family, and then the church, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to uh, be in that order to realize that it's God first then your family is your next ministry. And so um, because we are social beings, because we are, um, we are um, humans with a mind, body, spirit, you know, uh, uh, all of this, um, we need to get to that place where, um, like Lady P said, we, 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 our family is, is intact. Because if it, our family is not intact, how do you think we're going to run a church that is um, with, with so many people? If we can't manage our homes, um, then it's mm. it's going to be um, it's not impossible. But the the the, the genuineness of God uh, and 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 people will not be there. It's like you're operating in 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 falsehood. It's hypocrisy. In hypocrisy. Thank hypocrisy. you. Hypocrisy. Yeah. You know. You're uh, preaching one thing to tell other people what right. to do, but when exactly. you're not doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's where the hypocrisy comes in. And people see it. You know, people will see that. And um, and again, like you you prefaced your conversation saying some some people will make you feel good because when you are in front of a, a large crowd, they make you feel good. So you're not taking care of home. Will uh, it won't bother you for a while because you feel good when you are in front of these people. They they make you king, and um, and so but you're not king of your home. You're not the priest and prophet of of, of your home. 
Remember we were saying that we have to be careful as well that we don't believe the hype about yourself. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Think more highly of yourself. Get in trouble. Right. Highly yeah. of yourself than you are. Mm -hmm. Lady P, I want to thank you. I, I wrote this. I wrote that down. I don't know if anybody caught it. I, I love what you just said there when you said, "Build the relationship with what you want to last." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, I I like that. That's that's a good one. That's a good uh, mm -hmm. medicine for the soul. Just a sort of thought that mm -hmm. has a lot to, a lot of meat to it. Just build the relationship mm -hmm. with what you want to last. It kind of wow. makes you stop and say, "Wait a minute, who am I building relationships with?" And, Mm -hmm. What's really what, what? What is it? Who? What is it that I really want to last? Because that's the thing mm -hmm. that you'll build that relationship with. Thank yeah. you. That's a good one. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. My children, am I? And when I, you know, I'm talking from experience because I, I, I've been around a lot of pastors who put God, then the church, then their families, yeah. and mm -hmm. just by luck or just by happenstance, some of their families may be saved and some are not saved. Mm -hmm. um, but if we keep it in the right order, then it does work. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Gardner in North Carolina told the story of his uh, then, I believe he was an eight-year-old son. Um, and he was a busy pastor, you know. Um, and, you know, pastors get calls all the time and you have to go out and see the members and everything else like that. And he had a ritual, he said, with his son where he would read him a bedtime story. It's something that they did. And this one particular night, you know, he got a call um, from a member that needed him to, that wanted him to come over um, and, and counsel or pray with them. And it, it, he was, his son was just about getting ready to go to bed. So he said, you know, well, daddy, we have to read our book first before you go. And he said to him, you know, well, son, we can't do that right now. I have to go. Somebody's called, one of the persons is called and they need me, so I, I've got to go. He said, but daddy, I, we have to read the book. And he said he started to get upset with the boy, you know, his son, like, you know, don't you understand, you know, daddy's a pastor, da 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 da, -da. I've got to go when I come back, maybe tomorrow kind of thing. So his, his son went upstairs and he got undressed and he stood at the top of the stairs as his dad was about to leave and go through the door. And he stood at the top and he says, wait a minute, you're supposed to give him my bath and read my story to me, daddy. And he said he was about to, you know, really lay into the boy. And as he was going up the stairs to lay into him, the boy looked at him and said, his son looked at him and said, if I was one of your parishioners, you would have time. There it is. And he said that he turned around, went downstairs, took off his coat, went back upstairs, gave him his bath, read his story, and then went over to the parishioner's house. Mm -hmm. and I think that fits right in line mm -hmm. with what you're saying, Sister Patricia, because I think sometimes um, a fall, a fall mentioned or, or in, the, in the past, it was almost like um, pastors were supposed to and leaders were supposed to neglect everything else apart from the parishioners. Uh, you know, um, if, they, if someone called at three and four and five and six, then you needed to be there at three and four and five and six in the morning, you know, um, and the pastors would be pulled. And a lot of them made unconscious choices thinking that they were devoted to God and to service and neglected their families. Um, I remember yeah. um, one of the great bishops at his wife's home going stood and cried. And he was an elderly man now had retired and what he did was call his children, ask his grown children to stand. And he repented and said, I'm sorry that I gave all of those years, all of my time was focused on serving the church and I did not serve you, my family. I never forgot that. It was so heart wrenching um, at this home going. Um, but we have to be careful, our humanity again, that we can neglect that looking about spiritual things when God wants us not just holy, but whole. I think that um, you, uh, some, some minister, some pastor forget that your family is a ministry as well. And that as you're trying to cultivate the church, you have to cultivate your family because your spouse is your help me and that's the one who truly have your back but if you forget you just push that person aside 
And then that's how uh, we get to the point where, um, as the apostle uh, uh, was saying, that you don't want your spouse any longer. You don't want to be with that because you're so focused on a church and what the members of the church, how they make you feel, how they lift you up when as your spouse could be that same person to lift you up if you just cultivate mm. your marriage your relationship that ministry mm. excellent ministry. excellent points um bishop mm. kev you this we we jump in when we feel something man so <laughs> if you feel like yeah. you wanna, if you feel like you want to share something just jump in um well i'm i'm absorbing because uh uh, I'm dealing with the repercussions of not doing a lot of things within my ministry. Uh, I know that if I could do some things over again, my family would be right here with me, but they're not. Mm. And uh, mm. I'm, I'm most guilty of uh, some of the things that the sisters are talking about. Uh, but one thing that I would say is uh, two things. Uh, uh, it's challenging to be a, an Episcopal apostolic leader in this time. Uh, yeah. If you go left, you're wrong. If you go right, you're wrong. If you go center, you're wrong. If you go up, you're wrong. <laughs> There's always some, some critical piece that, uh, that you miss. I know some pastors that play it right and have done everything uh, uh, correctly and, and their children are not saved or half of their children are saved or uh, it's always something uh, and I think that uh, we have to kind of slice and dice life and you know we you know we say it, we spit out the meat and uh, uh, spit out the bones and chew the meat and also I think that most of us here or some of us here at least are from the uh, the Caribbean mindset where we came up, we didn't see the vulnerability of our leaders. We expected they were perfect, that they were, then we had to be perfect too. And there was no explanation and there was no psychology there you go. and there was no, you know, just, just do it <laughs> <laughs> or yep. no, no gosa or something like that, you know, and we came up under that mindset. No, just pray. Just pray. Yeah, just, just pray. pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pastor Janet, just pray and it'll go away, you know. And uh, uh, but we realize now that we're grown and ministering into this age of 2020 plus that uh, it's it's it takes some work. It, it takes a chunk out of you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, you really have to be called of God in this season, because yep. if you're not called of God, boy, I tell you, you're not going to make it. Well, thank you, uh, Bishop Kev. Here, here's the thing, you know, I, I, I look at this from all sides. Here's the thing. A lot of people start ministry that were never called anyway. That's the first point. You know, who called you? Because <laughs> you, you, you look at the calling. If it's not of God, then, and you just want to do something, you know, um, Apostle, we, we've been talking about a scripture in Jeremiah that the Lord said that, you know, who did you take counsel from? Because it wasn't me. <laughs> some of you some of you some of them went but i didn't send them that's what the I lord said i didn't send them you know and we, we have a lot of that so because you're of that mindset then you think that i just got to go where god leads me and i'm just doing the will of god but your family you forget that your family is your as elder Stacy said your first ministry and going yes. back to uh, Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, he said, um, for, for if a man uh, knoweth not how to rule his own household, how shall he take care of the church of God? That's right. You know, and Amen. so he's worse than an uh, infidel. <laughs> and you know what an infidel is, right? An idiot. That's what, you know, I looked that word up. That's what it means. <laughs> yes, that's a sense of humor. And that's not me. That's the Bible. <laughs> So, right. Right. so right. you know, when I look at these things, sometimes, um, uh, panel, it, it, I, I wonder, you know, did you really, who, did you really get called? And okay, mm -hmm. if you did get called, can you minister to your family? Because your family is that when all is said and done, the only people you have left standing around you 
after you get beat up, <laughs> after you get slapped, <laughs> stabbed, <laughs> your family will be there for you. And because we don't treat our family right, you know, right. We, don't, we don't pray, we don't encourage, we don't spend time. That's the, that's the worst thing. Pastor Jay, you're talking right about, you know, many pastors are guilty of not spending enough time with their, right. their own family, your own kids, your mm-hmm. own, what, your spouse. And I think Lady P, Lady P said it earlier. I think Miles, Miles Monroe said it as well. You know, some of us are married. Uh, the men get married to the church and the wives get married to the children. <laughs> I didn't know Miles Monroe said that, but it I, is true. I, I think he did say that. Yeah, he said it one time as well. Um, so, so, Apostle, uh, you know, help us with this. <laughs> how do we, <laughs> you know, how do we, you know, navigate that? Because it's a thin line, but, you know, it, it can be done if it's yeah. done correctly. <laughs> right? Uh oh, whose phone is that? Your phone? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, okay. The the whole thing is this: it's okay to recognize your identity. Okay. It's okay to recognize your well. I don't want your morphology, your your structure, your that you're a um, a spiritual being who has a body in which you live mm-hmm. and you have a mind and you have a soul and that's simply recognizing how you're made up mm-hmm. but when it comes to understanding your identity okay. it goes further than just understanding your makeup, you know, what you consist of. A lot of, and I'm just saying, a lot of men have not been affirmed Mm. in their manhood. Here we go. (laughs) By a man. Wow. Okay. Now let me explain to you all. And I am open for discussion. There is a reason why God had a woman in a man, and then she took he took, in fact, the, the woman out of the man and woke the man up, and the man saw the woman without being introduced he recognized that she came out of him and he also named her just as how he named the animals that God brought to him. Since then, something catastrophic has occurred. God wants a a, a boy child and a girl child to be affirmed by a father. No, that's good. That's good. I, I, I'm not I, I, I like people who scream and holler. And, and, <laughs> no, no, I'm too. I am. I believe absolutely that women and the weaker sex. I don't believe that women are inferior to men, nor are men superior to women. I believe the both are important, but I tell you this, God wants a girl and a boy to be affirmed by a father. That is not happening and it has not happened for a while. Now, how I know? because I've seen it firsthand. My father was, I think they call it minister of, um, in, in, in British colonies, they call it secretary in, in America of education. And he took the time to take me all over when he would go 
and he had to open schools. And I was right there in the car with him. And so I, I was affirmed by a father. But there is something else that did not happen, brothers and sisters. A father is important in the affirmation of both the sexes of children. But a mother is also important in the nurturing and the emotional um, tempering of a child. If you never had a mother's love, you will not be able to receive or give love you would not be able to respect a woman, even if you are a woman yourself. You know, it's a lot of little situations. So, so, so we have a lot of things going on. So when you ask me how we can deal with this, with men and women in ministry, realizing the importance of being transparent and taking care of their relationships with their spouses and and I've heard this for years God first <laughs> family second church third I have never seen it in the Bible the only thing I see in the Bible is in everything in all thy ways acknowledge him God and he will direct meaning God family church everything need to be in God That's right. we all we all need to, the family, the marriage, the children, the spouse, the church, people will, should all be centered. You, the pastor, should all be together centered in God. That way, there will be no ungodliness. In you, the family, the, the church members, because we're all saturated, we're all immersed in God. So there's no first, second, and third. We're all in God. So anytime, and I love that story about that pastor, you know, coming back to, to deal with his son before going on. When, when you're in God, and this is the big thing, we, uh, and I think I'm in a safe place to say this, all of us on this line, for some reason, coincidental or divine providence, have a common connection. That commonality is a Afrocentric Caribbean disposition or heritage or culture, or upbringing, whether it's Jamaica, where I don't know. But the thing is, because we grew up with no-nonsense Black people who were our parents, who didn't yeah. mix words, they didn't say gay, they said homosexual. You know, they didn't say, you know, well, they're, um, they're partners, you know, they're shocking. You know, they, they, you know they, they said it as it is. Yeah. We have no ambiguity concerning the correctitude of things. We, we know what should happen, what shouldn't happen. We know when we're wrong. We don't need a prophet to tell us when we ain't living right. We know, you know, we, 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 we know. <laughs> what happens is because of our disposition, we find it hard to navigate or even assimilate the craziness that we are seeing going on in the church, in this fair land, you know, home of the brave and land of the free. The, the, the thing is, the only way that we can deal with this situation, we have to start at the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, God did not start a church. He started a marriage relationship between a man and a woman. That is where I believe one of the pastors also said, we must remember that your marriage is a ministry in itself. 
if we could just get back to the basics of realizing the person that we got married to, we didn't marry them because they got a nice pair of pants or they, they, they hair nice and long or they had copper colored skin. Because let me tell you, one bout of illness <laughs> could, change, <laughs> could change the whole situation. So we got married because we found something in that person we didn't find in anybody else. So once you start building from the building block of the, of the church, which is the family, once you start building your family relationship with your spouse, your children, there's a little thing that people don't do anymore. It's called family devotion. And I'm not talking about reading a, I'm not talking about reading a Bible and saying some prayers. I'm talking about communing with each other, mm -hmm. devoting ourselves to God together by sitting around something that used to be called a dinner table and having dinner together. <laughs> yeah. Instead of Maxine in her room, looking at the television, eating while Kevin somewhere in the Take, basement playing takes, video games, eating. Dad in the man cave with Vibert on the phone, eating. <laughs> and mommy with Teresa in the bedroom. <laughs> With the door closed, whispering and eating. <laughs> the, 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 th the thing is, yes, the that, that, that's the situation. <laughs> what are they whispering about? <laughs> they whispering about. Yeah, yeah, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the thing. So we have to go back to the basics. Yes, sir. Yes. And start. And I think that's what this pandemic God is using Amen. the pandemic to do. Get back, back to the base. We got to be together, learn each other, love each other. And you'll be surprised to see how you're not going to, and I love this, we're not going to find love from the people that we, that, that, that askewed love that we were trying to cultivate with the people. The people cannot take the place of your spouse. The people can't take the place of your children. You know, I'm telling you, listen, let, let, y'all grown. I could tell y'all, y'all grown people. Let, let, let me say this. We, we grown, Apostle, yes. The, 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 the thing is this. This is my second marriage. Not because I'm wild, but because my hey, first well, bride, <laughs> <laughs> my first bride died of pancreatic cancer. Ooh, painful. She was given three days to live and she lived almost two years. She had 1,542,222.21 cancer markers in her body. Oh, and it went down to 1,400. Then it came back with a vengeance. And I never y'all y'all grown so i'm telling you all these things i never forgot what she said to me we went for our 29th wedding anniversary she didn't want to go to hawaii she wanted to go to savannah i don't know why i just do the lady tell me so we went to savannah and she said when i die you're gonna miss me i said what you i say we believe in god for a miracle you you're doing fine and she said ah. she said when i die you're gonna miss me but I want you to understand who you are. Know your identity. Don't worry about your title. Who you are. Know who you are. She said, you're going to need to know this. She said, you are Apostle Jason Owen. She said, that word apostle only describes your calling. Right. But you got to know who Jason Owen is as an apostle and what God called him to do as an apostle because it's not like we call somebody else to do. And she said to me, you cannot stay single. You don't have that gift. She said, how I know? Because I know you for years and you're not, you, you, you like ice. You got to stay in the fridge. 
you if you stay outside the fridge you're gonna melt <laughs> so you know you yourself to, yeah, you know the, exactly. You understand? I'm trying to tell you, sister. Yes, Patricia. sir. And also, you've got to know who, and that's the big problem. She, she said to me, she said, "Look, that's good. When I die, you're gonna want to lock yourself away like some monk, mm -hmm. and put a shrine up for me, name everything after me, and ask anything." She said, "Don't do that." She said, "Right now, you need to be in prayerful vigil." looking around yourself for who you gonna marry when I go. <laughs> she said, don't date them, don't do anything, but you need to know who she is. She said, you know a lot of women, you know a lot of people in ministry. You need to identify who that woman is now when I die. Now, you need to know that now. You need to trust God to show you that now. When I die, give the Negroes one year, so you know, they, they you know, People crazy. The Negroes. Give them a year because if you do it next week, they're going to say, you see? Yeah. So give it a year. Mm -hmm. Give it a year. <laughs> At the end of that year, marry that woman. Wow. She said, you know why? If you don't do that, you're going to be dating Betty one Sunday. Mm -hmm. And by Sunday afternoon, you're with Ingrid. And then Monday morning with Eunice. <laughs> so before that kind of fooling, it don't look nice. No, sir. You know, you can't be leading, planting churches. Are you doing this juggling? Do it. So I'm telling you all that to tell you this. I listened to that woman and I got married to Phyllis. You know something, the terrible thing about it. They are not two women alike, but they are some holy characteristics mm. that groups of women share. Mm. Meaning, if you go to a little place called a brothel or a whorehouse, the women in there share a certain <laughs> characteristic. If you, yeah. go to a, if you go to a shut-in, in a holiness Pentecostal church, the women in that shirt didn't share a certain ethic mm -hmm. and morality. That's right. So they're not the same, but they have the same existential identity. They, they, they hold the same morals. And so, mm -hmm. so I marry a woman who don't curse, don't do bad things. And you know what happened? My weakness needs that kind of woman. <laughs> okay. I can't have a woman who worshiping me thinking I'm Jesus <laughs> and believing all the little stupid lies I'm telling her. <laughs> I need a woman who is prophetic Amen. and who could see through my male foolishness. Come on. So every time the soloists get up to sing, and I say, oh, my God, praise God, she has a wonderful voice. That woman could say, no, no, darling, it's not the voice you're excited about. You need to stay holy and stay focused. No, I'm still, I could lie to y'all all night. That's long, good, sir. But yeah. I'm talking right. I am here to tell y'all truth. You're talking good, yeah. sir. <laughs> so when I was thinking of a social worker who was giving me the eye passing notes, like if we in the fifth grade, during a meeting, because I am a hospice consultant. Yeah. And I had my little plans, brethren, I had my plans. You know, a little Jesus seasoning yeah. over the little devil excitement. I had my plans. He's saying it right. You know, we're going to say the Jesus way. Jesus. So I'm writing, you know, I'm writing that down. Jesus. And I had this thing planned. And I jump in the bed so I can rest up for the jump. And I jump in the bed to sleep. And my bride said, get up. I said, what's wrong? She said, get out of this bed. I said, what happened? She said, that girl you thinking about and the little plans you have. Don't lie in this bed with that spirit. Mm. <clears throat> Go hmm. to your study and pray the thing off for you and then come back. Okay. Wow. 
That is the kind of woman I need. Y'all could lie. I tell you, I'll get it true. That is the kind of woman I need. So let me say this. Now that she is in heaven, I don't know how she do it, but it's like she's still alive because this new wife is the same way. <laughs> so I'm just trying, y'all laughing. Listen, so I'm just trying to help y'all. You're helping us, sir. <clears throat> My thing is to answer the question, we as men and women have to know our identity. That's good. And if you know that you can't smell a Johnny Walker red without polishing off two bottles, don't go near people who drink in Johnny Walker. That's good. If you know that you can't Google something without trying to Google Tommy does Dallas uh, with the chick name, <laughs> you, you stay away from the computer. That's right. If you, I'm still just being honest. If you know that you have a tendency of having reckless eyeballs and nervous fingers where you can't see a woman like you got a sickness. What you need to do is not a man. I'm trying to look, y'all don't get any started. Don't go finding no man and sit down and tell him you got this lust problem because all of us got the lust problem. We can't wait to see it. The <laughs> thing is, Find a woman who holy who gonna tell your little self to get yourself together. Don't find no little girl who think that you're the best thing since sliced bread. Find a woman who don't care about you or how you look. She just wants Jesus and let her prophesy in your life and get you on track. Wow. A man can, and I'm just teaching this thing so people could grasp. You're teaching good. A man cannot de uh, deliver another man from something he himself is struggling with. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Well, good. I don't care how anointed he is. I don't care if it's T.D. Jakes or R.D. Rakes <laughs> or whoever. <laughs> you, if you're struggling with the same thing like me, I don't care how big your church is, how much you know around the world. You can't help me. I'm, serious. I'm talking from human experience. Mm -hmm. I had this thing planned, people. I had the thing planned. This girl had an exotic name. Something like Shonda, Shantiria, some kind of fancy name. <laughs> and, and this child, no, you girl, listen. Let's make it tingle, she right? <laughs> Yeah, and she used to look look at you through her hair. Well, she would, yeah, she would throw it over her eyes Good and God, give it a glance. Stop it now. And Stay she right passed and, yes. <laughs> so this, I'm telling you, and I had my little plans. I had my, I never forget that as long as I live. I had my plans. I'm going to go downstairs. Done. I'm going to open the garage door without the electricity. Just raise it up quietly. Push the car down the drive. <laughs> Not let me get this done. Um, yeah, it plan. I used to run three, three miles a day, two hundred push-ups, and push. I'm not. I fit, and I push. I had this thing planned, and I lie in the bed. Wow. Waiting for the time of escape. Wow. And my bride said, "Get up, get out of this bed." I said, "What happened to this woman?" So I'm just trying to tell you, we need not. And I'm sorry to say these things. We need to stop playing games and want to build with material that is specific to building something that will last. I think somebody said that. Yeah. Don't build things that ain't going to last. Mm -hmm. Build things that mean something and that can leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. people of God to follow. So that's the big thing. The church has become too much of a Jesus Christ superstar arena. Mm -hmm. Where 
all of us, we learn a couple of scriptures. <laughs> we buy some nice suits and shoes to match. <laughs> and we could say things quick and with rhythm. Yeah. And people get excited. We get a big crowd. We start making nice money. A Bentley is nice, private jet. And it becomes a business. And we don't pray. We don't fast. Mm -hmm. We have nice catchy phrases we use. Mm -hmm. And we call them affirmations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and things. So we are no longer in spiritual realms mm. of holiness and the Holy Ghost jurisdiction with power over. No, no. We doing this thing with some Jesus seasoning. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like so that. If we that stay, is the problem. So go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if we stay in places like that, we stay. if we stay in that kind of mold, um, the truth is we're fooling we're, we're, fool, we're not fooling God, put it that way. We're not no. fooling him. It's the, it's the same as having a form of godliness and still denying the power thereof. Oh. And one, one of the things that I, I, I mean, I guess, I guess is, is, is my, you want to call it that hobby horse, you know, the platform you get on or whatever it is, is, is being real because the only way you can get free is when you are real. It's not only just, it's not only about loving my spouse as well, but you know what? I'm having to learn to be able to truly love me too. Mm. All the thing, all the things about myself that I might. You see, sometimes we're hardest on ourselves because we know ourselves. We know the weakness. We know the so and so. We know whatever. Um, and in this time, I, I really do think, if, as leaders, we have to be able to deal with our own stuff so that we can help create safe spaces so that others can deal with their stuff because we all got stuff if you know what i always said this just get them and preach a message on stuff and everybody gonna have something come to their mind oh, yeah. well, you won't have to label it you won't have to name it just say stuff and everybody has something that's going to come to mind but until yeah. we are real until we take off the mask you know somebody said the masquerade is over take off the mask have a safe space so that we can truly be real then god can can work in that realness and we'll see some miraculous stuff taking place not mm -hmm. just once in a while <laughs> right. not just one off yeah we, we can live in that realm that's what we were talking yesterday when, when paul says about the armor the one of the things he says after the armor is praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit yeah. praying in the spirit not not just praying but praying in the spirit, being led by the spirit. Because when you don't know what to say and when your words are fumbling, he can interpret it and make it sound good in the, in the father's ear. Take, the Holy Spirit can take it and intercede for you. You sound like blah, 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 blah. And he's interceded your heart to God. Yeah. Just like we said, just like a mother, a toddler, come and talk in the room and go, come in the room and say, and nobody else knows, but the mother's turned around and said, the baby said this. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the Holy Spirit does for us mm. as children of God. We can sound like blah, 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 because we don't have it all together. And the Holy Spirit, when we're praying in the spirit, can take that babble and intercede and interpret it to the Father. So the Father knows exactly the heart of the child. So we've got to be able to first create a safe space so we can talk about some of these things. I was saying, you, you can't give the reprimand af after the thing has happened. That always used to astound me. The, 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 the girl is now pregnant. She's out of, she's not married and everything else. And you turn around and say, you knew it was going to happen. Where was the council before this? Amen. Where, where was the safe place where the girl or the guy or whoever it is could come and say, listen, when I'm alone with so-and-so, you know, I, I feel like I'm struggling because I get to this point and I know when the talking stops and the atmosphere changes, but oh gosh, it's not, I'm just not strong enough to get it. And what do I do? Where is that place? Mm. It's, it, it's rare, Pastor. It's, 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 it's rare because when the apostles uh, wanted to do some things and they couldn't do it, uh, they said, Lord, how come we couldn't cast it out? And the Bible said, how be it this kind go with by prayer and by fasting? And uh, the apostolic prophetic gifts are so, so rare. They're rare to the point where you even have to have a, a discernment to know what is anointing and what Come is now. gifts. Come on now. We're living yeah. in the season of gifts. 
meaning you got a <laughs> gift to sing. You ain't right, but you still got a <laughs> gift. And God ain't going <laughs> to shut down the gift because he gave it right. to you. Because the gift and callings of God are without repentance. <laughs> but what's the difference between the anointing and the gifts? Well, the the when you sing under the gifts, people will, oh, my God, that was blessed. When you sing under the anointing, people will get saved. Things will awesome. break when you sing on yeah. the anointing. Stuff break. Actions get changed. And we talked about this before as well. That guess what? Just because just because you can hold a note and you've got some good harmony going on and you can do some riffs, but you live in like a devil. Well, it might sound good and pleasant in the ears of man, but it might sound like nails on a chalkboard in God's ear. Yeah. Because he hears some, he hears the heart again. He, he's, not, he's not looking at what we look at. He hears, he's hearing the heart. He knows what the life you're living. So we, we've got to be careful. You know, we look, I'm only talking about pointing the finger at me then. When I'm talking, I'm pointing. I don't, I always say this. Every time I speak on a message or a topic, I either got to live it or it's coming soon. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I got to be able to stand behind what comes out of this mouth. You, you see what I'm saying? So we've got to live that. We've got to be real enough to say, you know what? Because I know God's got me, that whatever he needs to expose, whatever he needs to do, then he, he's, he's going to protect me too. And so it's okay for me to be real. It's okay for me to say that I might struggle here and struggle there. And can you help me? The problem is we don't have enough safe spaces for that. But in a platform like this where we can share, guess what? We then have to take it from this platform. We can't just stay here on the Zoom. Yeah. We've, got take it, we've got to take it to our marketplaces and create yes. spaces for the real people yeah. that we are touching physically. I, I mm. agree. I thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Pastor Jane mm. and Bishop Kev. Apostle, I, I want to. I, you listen. <laughs> this is so rich right here. There is one <laughs> point, one thing that you said, and I, I, it kind of stood out to me as well as we're talking. Um, you said that who who are you without your title? Uh -huh. and, you said, and you said we have to know our identity. And the problem is mm -hmm. we don't know who we are without the title. Mm -hmm. We go by what people call us. We go by what they the crowd says. We go by and we feel good about that. But until see, here's 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 the, the other point I wanted to make as well. When God called Moses up to, to mm. Mount Sinai, right? Mm. God said to Moses, he said, take off your shoes because the yeah. ground you're standing on is, is holy ground. But this is what we, and, and then you never hear Moses put those shoes back on. Moses, because God was trying to change, give him an identity. And I think, Pastor Jay, you talked about this last early last year. Yep. It's you, about him. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. I, I said for <laughs> myself, my, my journey was this, because I, I was just going to pull it up right here again. My journey was this. Well, so let, me, let me finish. Let me finish. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and so you never hear Moses putting those shoes back on after God told him to take it off, because God didn't want Moses with his identity. God wanted to give Moses his identity, right? Yeah. So Moses left the presence of God with God's identity and not his own anymore. Yeah. He didn't put those shoes back on. And see, yeah. we, this is the problem with us. We get into the presence of God and we try to keep our identity when God doesn't need none of us. He wants us to strip us of everything. Take off your shoes, take off your clothes, because I want to give you a new identity. But because they call us apostle, mm -hmm. because they call us pastor, because they call us elder, we respond to that because we think that's our identity. And it's not. <laughs> so we have to know who we are without that title, without that affirmation, without that ordination. Who are you? Uh, in the present who are you because a lot of us you know and i'm not saying us on this panel here i'm just saying in reference to what you said apostle it hit me because a lot of us put on that facade and we I think pastor jay said it and we hide behind that facade mm -hmm. instead of being becoming real and that's why mm -hmm. people like bishop kev said that's why people can't there's no say people can't come to us because we're not real you know we ain't real and they don't want to share with us. That's why they do mess up Pastor Jay. They, you know, I get hot. I don't know what to do with that. So I just do it. 
because mm -hmm. there's no place to, for me to go because the pastor's not real, the apostle's not real, they probably shacking up themselves, you know, it's a whole, and there we go, we go with this whole thing, okay? So, you know, the point I wanted to make is that, you know, our identity is important without the title, without, you know, you said, it's not, a, your wife said, I'm not talking to you as an apostle, I'm talking to Jason. <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm talking to yes. Jason. Jason, get yeah. out the bed and go get yourself yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. no disrespect, yeah. Apostle. That's no disrespect. Yes. No, no, you're right. You're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> but you know, until we can confront who we really are without those titles, because your title is not who you are. And when you get to heaven, God is not going to ask you about your title. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that that's the, the 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 problem too in 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 the ministry of of your family right because you're never the husband at home you're always the pastor at home oh. and sometimes you got to differentiate between you being the husband at home um and and leave, and, and and leave the pastor at church because you're now at home in the bed you are my husband and I, and I think you, we can't differentiate that because of the title that comes with it. And we often uh, brings it home and uh, use that same posture to, again, taint and tarnish the family structure. Because uh, now, now, you know, now I don't want to go to church because I can't deal with you at home. So how am I going to deal with you as my pastor? Because I don't have, I don't, I don't have that, that relationship. And, and sometimes they don't know, you know, who are you without the title? Are you a husband, a father? Um, um, are you pastor father? Are you, you know, you know, you, know, you, just, you just have to uh, be able to differentiate that uh, when you get home. Because home is where you are the priest, the prophet, you know, the husband of of one wife of your wife you you know you 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 are home and that's where relationship begins and if you if you don't have the heart of god to love um then you know you're going you you you're not even going to love um the sheep as much because you you can't even love your wife mm -hmm. wow mm -hmm. you know so, if if, if okay. I could interject, if I could interject and share some transparency with you concerning my situation, uh, I didn't fail necessarily as a pastor. Uh, mm -hmm. I failed as Kevin, and when mm -hmm. Kevin fails, everything topples. Come on, topples. Come on. because I could about. I could fail as a pastor and still bounce back. Mm -hmm. Okay, because Kevin is intact, but when Kevin fails. Everything go down. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, uh, uh, we, your family, your ministry, the title that you are, who you are, everything has to walk in cadence. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. when Jerry is marching, good, everybody's so. got their gun and sh boots shining and <laughs> shoes are moving and everybody's going at the same speed and you notice what happens when two or three of them are moving a little slow it messes up the formation of the whole military so what we are in god our title our office uh, uh our uh, workplace uh position it's all intertwined and it all has to move in the cadence of god and if one of them steps out of line too much everything go down yes that's good, that's good. so that is good i thought i thought i thought i did okay sorry <laughs> yes I'm, I'm looking at this again um and that whole thing comes to me because i guess again you know in my own journey that just realizing that identity tended to be what somebody else said like you said identity tended to be what somebody else calls you we all are yeah. given identities as we grow right you are you are son you are father you are pastor you are brother you are uncle and so and so why because somebody tells you that's who you are that's as you evolve yeah. as well and for women as well the titles keep going and i said i said before my own journey that god one day had to say to me i'm crushed that what i was going through was such a crushing 
was that he was telling me, I am destroying your identity. And I'm thinking, well, why would you want to do that? He said, because I didn't give you that. I created Amen. my image. Amen. I created yes. this image. That's what I want. You see, if you if you keep trying to live according to identity, you're living for what somebody else has said, what yes. somebody else told you are. But when you are living according to the image of God, that is completely different. That's something that's supernatural. Ah, that yes. that's supernatural. Mm -hmm. When you look in a mirror, you don't see identity. You see an image looking back at you. And God mm -hmm. was telling me that he, want, he wanted me to understand that I was created in his image. Yes. And that's how I needed to walk. That, that freed me from feeling accountable for some of the things that did not belong to me that somebody else was giving me. Mm -hmm. Good. You know what I'm saying? They yes. want you to carry that carry the baggage they want to give you, but it doesn't mm -hmm. belong to you. They want to put you in a box where you don't belong. Yes. They, because God didn't give that to you. God didn't put you in that box. And he was saying, well, when I... If you just listen to me, let me destroy this identity. And I was holding on tight because it was all I knew. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. all, all you know. But he was ripping that thing to shreds because he wanted to create me, wanted me to understand that he created me in his image. And I'm going back and I'm looking at it. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. He said, I created you in my image. And he talks about you're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna put on the image of God. You it was no mm -hmm. not identity, you're gonna put on the image of God. So when people look at you, they're going to see Christ. It's going to mm. reflect you, your life, your being will reflect the, oh gosh. Mm. All right, I'm, I'm, let me, I'm good to you, yeah. Let me mute English myself. Song. Let me mute. <laughs> I tell you. Praise God, praise God. Praise God. Praise God, praise yep. God, praise God. This is, <clears throat> this is good here tonight. I'm, Jesus. You know, so blessed um Amen. apostle I, I i i thank you for sharing your you know i wasn't expecting it <laughs> but i thank you for being real and transparent because you know and i'm not saying you wouldn't do that but it's just where we are right now you know yeah, it's so it's yeah. so important um yeah. to to hear somebody be real you know um and uh, Bishop Kev for, for speaking from, you know, reality. This is this is what yeah. we're dealing with. You know, yeah. this is where yeah. we're at. This is what we're dealing with. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it makes no sense. We've, we've been fluffing it for years. <laughs> you so to well, speak, quote unquote. You know, we've yeah. been, you know, and people have really needed us to be real and relevant, as Lady yeah. always said, and righteous. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to find people. Oh, it's very hard to find. And and I I'm just so blessed, um, Apostle. I don't I you know, we, we can be here till ten o'clock. I mean, if you, have to leave, if you have to leave, if you have to leave, sir, then I understand. If you have to leave, but I mean, I I, I want to digest this no. just a little bit more. <laughs> no, no I I'm enjoying it because um, you know, especially that identity thing. People telling you who you are. Yeah, try to um, label you. Yeah. Know, you know, that has been our biggest problem. We've been living based on someone else's estimation and oh. assessment of who we are. And uh, we need to get into the image of God concept, um, biblical concept of being created in his image and after his likeness. Amen. Um, and just embrace it, you know. Um, you know, I, I don't want to start anything, but, but you know, <laughs> it's, before, it's too late. <laughs> you know, we, you know, you start trouble always. We a, it started we already. Had a joint conference with um, Word Empowered Manhood and Women of Excellence and uh, brought it together. And we would have the men go with my wife and the women go with me and you know talk and then switch it around and then bring them back together wow and um getting to understand the misconceptions uh where women thought that their husband was simply their girlfriend with a penis and um men taught that women were just a sex object and um, they had to understand the, 
biblically prescribed roles of a woman and a man. And um, it, it brought about some tremendous healing and um, rearrangement of perspective and adjustment of who people really are and getting in touch with a true identity. So, you know, to hear um, what, um, you know, I'm hearing tonight is quite reminiscent of, of those days when we had that kind of thing going on. Russell, I have a question. Yes, um, how, how do you feel about the people who are divorced? Well, I'm married to a divorced person. Um, when Janine, my first bride who is in heaven, told me to look for someone, the only person that God impressed heavily on my life was a young woman from Russellville, Alabama, via um, Dayton, Ohio who was an executive director at an assisted living facility that I had to call on as a hospice consultant. And I was helping with team building and whatnot. And God said, this woman is your next woman. And I told God, I said, God, you, you got to understand it. Um, I am. I grew up Pentecostal, uh, and this woman is a Baptist, and um, I was married to a woman from South America, Guyana, like myself. This woman is an American, and God, you know, I was married to someone who was never married before, but this woman is divorced, and God told me. And I'm sorry to say it the way that he told me, but it's true. He said, some people get married while other people merely had a wedding. So when I hear the issue about divorce, you have to understand that godly revelation that God had given me. Some people were genuinely married while other people merely had a festive occasion known as a wedding. Wow. And um, when the Bible says that a bishop or a local church pastor should be the husband of one wife, in the Greek vernacular, it means one wife at a time. At a time. <laughs> so when a person is lawfully divorced, meaning that they didn't just run away, they got a bill of divorcement, they are not married anymore. Now, the what we call Pauline epistles dealing with a woman being put away, and if she is put away, if any man marries her, that man commits adultery. That is a different dispensational truth. Um, it is talking about a woman being put away for any cause, as Jesus was confronted with by the disciples of Rabbi Hillel versus the disciples of Rabbi Shama. And um, Hillel was teaching that you, if you, you can put away your wife at all, Shama was teaching that you could put away your wife for adultery, fornication, um, worshiping another God, you know, hedonism and paganism, and that kind of thing. So anyhow, so basically, my view biblically on divorced people 
being remarried or even being ordained into ministry. If they are saved, if they are living for God, if they are lawfully divorced, I have no problem with those people. Now, if a person is not lawfully divorced, if a person is what we call a serial bride or a serial groom, meaning that they get married every five minutes and divorce every five minutes, that person has a commitment problem. That person has a psychological problem and needs counseling and whatnot. Um, but if a person is lawfully divorced, living for God, serving him, dedicated to him, I have no problem with uncalled by God. I have no problem ordaining that person or in, in any case, performing a wedding between that person and somebody else. And this is, you're talking to a man, and I'm glad that you asked that question, Pastor Patricia, because I came from a tradition that even discussing this was grounds for excommunication. <laughs> um, so I'm just yep. telling you. Um, no, I, 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 let me tell you all the truth. None of us are 15 or 25 anymore. If we ever were to seek a spouse in our age range or age group, we will be very hard pressed to find a person who was never married and a person who never had children. Right. That, that would be like going to a convent and dealing with nuns. And that's a different kettle of fish. Um, but I'm just telling you, um, I have no problem with it. And for those reasons. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Any, any other questions? I mean, <laughs> I... <clears throat> One thing that I do want to say, we're talking about identity, and I guess uh, uh, Elder Wilkinson and I can uh, uh, really understand this. Sometimes the identity affirmation doesn't come from who you expect it to come from. Yes, sir. Sure. You know? Sure enough. I think that we all came up under a, a certain... Uh, cultural nuance in the church that we were expected to carry on to almost be robotic. Mm -hmm. I do it like this. And to get to fit in, you almost had to become that. It's like old folks have a saying, do it how I want it to be done. And then when I die, you can change it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So in my particular journey, I had to kind of, I'm, I, I respect and cherish the traditions and the cultural nuances that I came up under. Am I that person? Today, I'm totally opposite from that, but I still remember the past because that past that I got, though it was rough, though it was hard, uh, it, 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 it molded me into who I am today, but it didn't, it didn't engulf, it didn't take over me, it transformed me to who I am. So I look back at, you know, uh, the culture, the, the saints, you know, Sister Janet, no, you know, the, 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 the good things, the things that made us who we are, but are we those people today? No. <laughs> I've always been one. Um, I wasn't good at being those people back then either. I was about to go there. I was about to say that. I've always been one of them too. You, you might have been a little different, but you was in the mix. I was always, yeah. I was I'm just, always. I, I, you know what? I always, I always respected. I always yes, respected yes. and loved there, but I think I've always had that edge thing that was because um, relationship was the most was important to me. Yes. Building yes. relationship allowing the youth to be honest, allowing them to, you know what I'm saying? So 
Um, and, and maybe it's one of the reasons in terms of my own, my own journey and, and my own childhood and growing as well. I think it's one of the things that led me into education and then led me into marriage and family therapy because the family unit to me was, was the most important thing of what takes place in there. It, it spills out and it comes out in all of us. Mm. Mm. With Nobody with... is untouched by their family unit. That's right. No, that's right. That's right. Nobody. Good or bad. Mm -hmm. Either one. Mm -hmm. I guess I was the rebel then growing up because I, I always questioned why I have to be what you say that I am. That was my oh dear. <laughs> <You said that. laughs> why? I'm who, you know, um, I look back, I, my name, I asked my mother where my name, where she got my name from. And of course she said she got it from a Diane Steele novel because she loved Diane Steele. But me wanting to know my my own identity and for me it was hard because i was the only child and people already like you said put those titles on you of being spoiled being selfish and being pretty madonna whatsoever not knowing that i'm a nurturer and that i'm a giver and so i had to really search and look even, you know, in the at a young age, because I didn't like those titles. Why, you know, why I have to be what you say that I am? I'm not selfish. I'm not spoiled. In some areas, yes, but not <laughs> as people say. But in my search of uh, of my own identity of who I am, and knowing what my name was, God showed me that my name me. I was loyal. I'm, you know, my name means loyalty, that I'm loyal. And I find out even to this day that I am quite loyal. Uh, and sometimes I feel like I'm too loyal to a fault, but I know God did that for a reason. But it, you know, when people put those titles on you, it makes a difference. Um, I know for my children, I gave my children their names for a reason. My daughter, she's the youngest and the only girl. I named her Candace because I want her to know that she was the queen. That's what the Bible, the eunuchs call the queens of Ethiopia. So your name means that you're a queen. So you take that and you do what it's will, but that's what I look at you as a queen because that's what they were called in the Bible. I look at my oldest son who is autistic. Uh, even though I gave him the combination of his grandfather's middle name, Joseph, James, it was the fact that I told him, I said, Joseph, remember, he was the, the earthly father for Jesus. That means um, James was the brother. You mean that that's something. Mm. My 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 middle son, his name is Christopher. I told him that means that's Christ-like. So you go, mm -hmm. you Christ-like. I want you to know that you Christ-like. So your, for me, the the names I gave them was to help them with their identity, mm -hmm. to know who they are, mm -hmm. who I see them as, not as, you know, how some people get them like, oh, I named my child Hennessy. Or Alize, no, you're not laying name after no liquor or no drink. Your name means That's right. and I think especially the younger generation is not named. My child Guinness. Sorry. Yeah, they don't name, you know, they, they forget that naming your child means something, that it should have a meaning behind. It. Now, you know, you name them out for a car, or a bottle of alcohol that you like, or, you know, something like that, you know. But, that, but that's exactly it. L listen to what you're saying and listen to the deterioration. Bible days, the name sp specifically had meanings of what was to be manifest in that child's life. You're talking about the names that you gave your children to at least help point them in the direction where you wanted them to go in terms of their divine destiny. And you're talking about the younger generation now and giving them giving names like what you mentioned, Carl, but that's what's important to them. That's what's important to them. The car is important to them. So I'm gonna name the child after the car. That drink is important. That that drink, uh, what it, it signifies, having made it on some scenes, right? Zero. If you can have Cristal, 
Yeah, Cristal. If, if you can serve Cristal, you're serving that because mm. that thing is how many hundreds and thousands of dollars a bottle for that. So let's name my child Cristal because you are expensive. Yeah. So that's important. So yeah, the focus has changed. And so it goes back to, again, to what Apostle was saying, coming back to the beginning, bringing everything back in line with our God-given image. Yeah. So as you even name children or do whatever. Carrington, is, Carrington can tell you now. He will say it now. He'll say, Mommy, you call me Carrington. I says, yeah. I said, what does it mean? It actually, it's a British name. It means born of noble blood. Why? Because I don't want you on no street corner. You will not stand Man. on the street corner being called Carrington. <laughs> Okay, so and he understands and he starts saying that now, and he's seven years old. I want him to know that in his head. Sorry, Pastor Bishop. Bishop, Bishop Pim, Pim, I think that's your phone. Bishop, Bishop John. Pim. I apologize, it was somebody trying to call me. <laughs> sorry, Sister Janet. Sorry, sorry, Pastor. No, you're good, you're good, you're good. I'm just saying that, you know, as Minister Stacy is saying, those things they happen because it shows us the deterioration, right, in society. Yeah. We've got to bring our minds back to center on God. A lot of the stuff we're seeing now wouldn't be there if we were truly centered, our minds, our thoughts, our images were portraying what God says to portray. And some of the stuff we wouldn't allow to take place in our churches. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Did I say that? Yeah, you did. Oh, you're right. <laughs> remember the, the remember those old mothers that used to call it out. Oh yeah. Remember those old mothers? They come they'll, they'll come take you off the altar. <laughs> Back in the yeah. days. Out of the testimony line. Yeah. Thank you. Come up to you. Why was my baby? What you doing? I could smell what you was doing last night. Come on, oh, we come need to pray. <laughs> yep. What you what you got on, baby? Come here. Let me cover that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They now don't do we, that no more. Now we don't. Listen. Now we want to. We don't want to offend. We want to be so politically correct, right. and we want to be so accommodating, so that we are almost like pushing out holiness to accommodate everything else. Wow. No, 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 no. We can't push Jesus out. We can't push holiness out to accommodate mm -hmm. nothing else. Mm -hmm. It, it got to be the other way around. Yeah. But some yeah. don't want to do that because here we go again. We've talked about this before. The numbers. Yeah. The but numbers. they end up losing them anyway. Hey. It, even the old mothers, I find that even the saints we we have now that are of age, they don't want to they don't want to lose them. But really, they lost them anyway. Mm. Oh. But they got the numbers, and no power, and no oh. function to function, and nobody don't want to work, and nobody <laughs> have an inkling to work. True. That's why it's called perfunction. Perfunction. <laughs> perfunction, <laughs> yeah. Well. Our bishop, hmm. bishop used to say that all the time. Yeah, you're operating in perfunction. Yeah. So here is the stirring. This, this, is, this is a period of, of, of deep reflection and stirring. We have, we have, we've been, we're having to face a lot of things that we were not facing before. Pe people are having to deal with a lot of things they were not dealing with before. And that's, again, I say that's God's mercy. Mm. That is God's mercy. Because if you don't run with the, with the footman, how are you going to run when the horseman yes. comes? True, true, true. Well, I guess it goes back to, you know, thank you, all, Pastor Jay. Um, goes back to what the uh, Apostle was sharing in the beginning about the whole pandemic. You know, if, mm. if you're not anchored, <laughs> if, if we're not anchored in the Lord, then you know, we will act like the world. We will go crazy like the world with no hope, having no hope. There you go. You know, if in this life we have hope, we'd be men most miserable, mm -hmm. according to scripture. Um, but I want to, um, again, Apostle, I, I, I know you're a busy man. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and so I, I'm trying, I'm trying to, you're going to have to come back because <laughs> I got too much questions for you. <laughs> so, and I, and I can't ask them all tonight. Bishop Kev, you too. Um, and so um, I, I, I'm going to share one thing. Um, and then since since um, Pastor Pat asked you something directly, I'm going to ask you something directly too <laughs> for oh, myself. Okay. <laughs> this, is a safe place. this is a safe zone. Amen. Yes, it is. <laughs> safe and sacred. Safe and sacred. <laughs> safe and sacred. All right. All right, Gene. I, I hear you. <laughs> um 
So when I was in England, um, Apostle, when I was in England, yes. this for everybody too. When I was in England, <clears throat> um, I, was, I was a drummer. I used to play drums, right? I grew up playing drums. Mm. But there was something about the piano that fascinated me, right? And so mm. I started to go to this music school, right? In the, in the mm. late, close to the late 80s, in the middle of the 80s, right? I started to go to this music school, right? In, in mm. Mosley, in Birmingham, right? Mm. <laughs> and because there was something about the piano, in the back of my mind, this, is, this was my dream and my goal. I wanted to be able to see a piano anywhere, go anywhere in the world, see a piano and be able to sit down and play it. That was my dream. And so mm -hmm. I started this music school and I started to learn how to play the piano. Now, every night I would take home this little mm -hmm. Casio, you know, the one you buy for your kids, them little, <laughs> little rinky dink mm -hmm. ones, right? And I would, I would be at home on the bed, put the piano down on the bed and the notes I took in the class the same day, I would, you know, try to, you know, bang them out on the little Casio <laughs> every night, right? Mm. And so after a month, I found myself, mm. okay, I got a chord. I can do a chord with my right hand. I'm like, okay, because because my mm. dream, remember my dream, my goal was to be able to go anywhere in the world and see a piano and be able to mm. play it, right? And so one month, two months, I'm in there, I'm learning. I mean, every night, I used to walk with this thing on the bus, sit down with this thing under my arm <laughs> every night mm -hmm. after going to class, mm -hmm. right? It took me four years, okay? And so, mm -hmm. you know, time went on, time went on. I learned how to do a chord. Then I, I learned how to write a song, okay? Because to pass the exam, mm -hmm. to, to get that bachelor's degree, one of the things were you had to write a song and compose it from the beginning everything the parts the harmony wow. and the music <laughs> so mm -hmm. by the by the mm -hmm. fourth year um apostle i was able to write the song i passed the theory i passed the voice i passed the practical okay so i graduated right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. guess what i can do now i can go anywhere in the world see a piano and sit down and be able to play my point is this there was four things principles that I apply to myself and I call it my mantra you learn it mm. you practice it you master it and you excel in it those four things mm -hmm. were my mantra I learn it I practice it I master it and I excel in it and I've took taken those mm. four principles and I've applied that mm -hmm. to everything that I'm doing that I've done in my life so far right mm. Everything mm -hmm. in ministry, I learn it, I practice it, I master it, and I try to excel in it. In everything that I've gotten into in ministry, in my personal mm -hmm. life, in ministry, th that's my mantra. Because I want to be able to be successful by excelling. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. And so my question is, yes. <laughs> saying that to mm -hmm. say this, right, you got to help me with this. Is there anything, in your opinion, right, after listening to my story, am I missing, have I missed something, or am I missing something? That was my question, because it's, oh. bother, it's bothering, something is bothering me, and I'm not sure what it is, and so... Mm -hmm. Those principles, because I've, I've taken those principles. I mean, I don't know, maybe God just gave them to me and I've applied it to everything that I'm doing in my life, whether it be mm -hmm. academically, whether it be in ministry or with my mm -hmm. family. I try to learn it. I try to practice it. I try to master it. And then I try to excel in it. So that's my personal good. view. <laughs> good. No, no, that's good. There was a fella sent by God, whose name was Jesus. <laughs> and one day, he was on a mountain preaching to people, mm -hmm. and he stepped up a little higher than the rest of the people, and he called 12 men mm -hmm. 
that they may be with him, that he may anoint them and send them forth to preach. So he had a mantra as it were, <clears throat> and it was calling, anointing, you know, calling them mm -hmm. that they may be with him, anointing them, and then sending them out to preach. Four things. He called them, mm -hmm. had fellowship with them that they may be with him. Then he anointed them. Mm -hmm. Then he sent them forth to preach. Now, your mantra, as it were, mm -hmm. is that you would learn a thing, practice it, master it, and then excel in it. Mm -hmm. I am not going to get into andragogical and, you know, um, pedagogical, you know, teaching science and uh -huh. terminology. But I tell you this, there are two kinds of pursuits in life. Mm -hmm. One is linear, meaning that it has a beginning and an end. And the other is psychic, uh, cyclic, in fact. It's circular. It keeps going on, keep going on. Like in that movie, The Lion King, the circle of life, you know, that does a cyclic situation. Yeah. What you have embarked upon is a linear endeavor where you will begin at the point of learning. You will continue along the line by practicing what you have learned. Then you will go further along the line, which is a time sensitive line. It's like a timeline, like how you spend four years in, in college, you know, music school. Yeah. Then you will master it. And then you will excel in it. That's a linear thing. What is not what you're not doing or what you're not, you know, you're, you're missing the, the area of your missing something is not in your not doing it, but it is in your not realizing that you are doing it. <laughs> and that's what's frustrating you because the focus on the whole thing is. You learning, you practicing, mm -hmm. you actually becoming skillful in it mm -hmm. and, you know, mastering it, and then you excelling in it. But what is it? And how are you going forth in it that you have learned, practiced, mastered, and excelled? You are actually, and, and it's right here. You are actually drawing people together. You are actually bringing people together and developing relationships that are built on the foundation of other relationships that you've had as a teenager. And then as soon as you get in contact with someone who has significantly impacted your life for good, you add them on to the crew and you're building, 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 building. Now, hear what Jesus did. And this is gonna give you an idea. He went out and he saw people, he preached to them. Then he called some of them onto himself, his disciples. Mm -hmm. You know what you're doing? You calling Janet. You calling <laughs> Stacy. You calling Kevin. You calling Jason. You call. Man, be a part of this Zoom line. Be a part of this Zoom line. Be a part of this Zoom line. 
then you are calling each of us and you're making each of us independent of each other equally feel as though we are the most important people in your life. Yeah. By fellowshipping with us and showing us the value that we have in your life. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. He valued them. He, he affirmed them. He let them know, man, look, you're a part of me. I'm a part of you. We're doing this together. He ate with them. He slept with them. He, you know, everything. And then Jesus went a little further. He did impartation known as something we call anointing. He anointed mm -hmm. them. He imparted to them That's right. a piece of him. He gave them of himself. He anointed. You have given us of yourself. You have put together this Zoom platform. You have made us come into a place of safety and, uh, and, and um, confidence. And you have imparted to us what God has imparted to you. Just like how you have brought us together, you are helping us to now go, as Pastor Janet said, and affect our circle. Because when we get off of this Zoom platform, we're going to touch other people's lives. Now we have a different paradigm to follow. That's right. That's right. That we will touch people's lives the way that you have touched us. But here, the, the, the last part Jesus did not only call them, bring them to be where he was and be with him, fellowship, given them a, a part of himself, anointed them. He sent them forth to preach. Mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't looking to build a mega church, Jesus was looking to build lives that will in turn go and build other lives. That's right, that's right. So here what happened. You think, you see it's all about where you're standing. From where you're standing, your perspective is that you are learning things, you are indeed practicing them, you are mastering them and then you're gonna excel in them. But what are the things? The things are people, based or people-oriented pursuits. Mm -hmm. You have always been about impacting other people's lives mm -hmm. with the ministry of helps from a young boy, ministry of helps. You're looking to be the star. You're just looking to make somebody look good. You're just looking to make somebody excel. And you want to be good. You said you wanted to play a piano wherever you find it. Let me tell you, well, you know, you, 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 it's not simply you being able to play a piano wherever you find it. It's what happens when you play that piano. Mm. Mm. Hi, hi, hi. Yes, sir. You see? Mm -hmm. Like you, I had a choice between athletics and music. I was a sprinter and I dislocated both of my knees. I had to start <laughs> oh my God. running mid distance and long distance. And I took to the piano mm -hmm. and I started studying the piano and classical and this. And then I would go to church and sit down next to the organist. And you know, I was a young boy. And he would say, no, if you learn hymns, you're going to get lazy. You got to learn a lot of music so you can move around. And then, so I could play. But I never went like you to music school. I write music. I arrange music. Uh, and I never went to school for it. And when I go on, like I would go to anywhere, and I would see a piano and I play it. And I ain't no big time player like the other fellow. <laughs> Me either. And people start crying. Or people, you know, people, who, you know, I go to an assisted living and I just sit around and play on the piano. And people who never smiled, never were animated for a while start becoming animated. So, so same thing with you. Everything you do 
brings about a response in the atmosphere. You see? Wow. Now, the reason why you want to excel in it, you're using the word excel. God uses the word disciple. Mm. You don't want to keep it to yourself and just master it. You want to go beyond yourself and let it enrich other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So you call it excelling. God calls it discipling. Okay. <laughs> Transformational leadership. You look into transform other people's lives that they will become leaders themselves. So, so basically, the reason why you feel you missing something is your perspective. You're not looking at you the way God seeing you. You're looking at you from a standpoint of what's the purpose of my doing this? I'm not a bishop. I don't have a big following. People don't scream when they hear my name. You know, what's this for? I mean, what am I missing? I, I put all this time in. I've done all that. I mean, what do I have to show that? Ah, now, this is before your home going service, you know. Because usually at the home going service, people come up and say, you know, I just want to say a few words about John. And, um, you know, he was such a good. No, but you're hearing it now. You, and I just met you. I mean, uh, yeah. Kevin just introduced us. Um, and God had, you know, revealed these things. So, so I, I'm trying to encourage you. You are a perfectionist and you're looking for tangible results like all of us. But God wants to encourage all of us tonight, you included, I included, all of us, to start asking him what we miss him. Mm. Uh, when we ask God them kinds of questions, he don't answer us. Oh, my God, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you the list I got here. <laughs> or the things you missed. No, no. <laughs> he gives us a paradigm shift mm. and make us realize we're looking at the thing from the wrong angle. We're not missing anything. It's like pushing against a boulder, thinking that we're going to make it move. Not knowing that God told us to push against it to make our muscles strong. So it's a different perspective. So no, you're not missing anything. The only thing that you're so-called missing is the uh, perspective that God has concerning how he is using you in the midst of your meticulous Focus on detail and excellence. Can I encourage is, you, sir? Is, pardon? No, it's all right. I was going to, when you finish, sir. No, no, no. Um, so, you know, you, you, you're good. I, I don't think you, you're, you're falling short of anything. Thank I you, wanted, sir. I wanted to encourage you, um, Elder John, because as um, you were talking and then as Apostle were t was talking, I just started scribbling this stuff down here. And so I'm going to share it with you because you, you mentioned learn, practice, master, excel. And as you continue talking, the word I wrote down was pour. Mm. Maybe you have not added that to your mantra in terms of pour. And then <laughs> as Apostle was talking, I just wrote pour more. And as he was talking again, and he was mentioning your mantra, one of the things I put down was the why. Maybe that's the thing that's bothering you is because you have been you're trying to figure out the why. Because you can excel in it, but when you excel, then what? Uh. Then, then what? So the why is there, and then the words came to me, pour more. And then he mentioned again, and you talked about the piano wherever you go. And I thought to myself, and he, he mentioned uh, about that everything so far that you put in your mantra is about you. The learning is you. The practice is you, the mastering is you, the excel is you. The piece that I'm saying that came to me was poor, which is about everybody else. Mm. That's not about you, that's 
to everybody else. Then I wrote this down. You say you want the, you want to play the piano wherever you go. And I wrote this down. You want to play the piano. Why? To release music. It's not you want to play the piano. You want the piano to release music into the atmosphere. Why? Because you have an understanding of the power of its vibrations in the atmosphere and what it can do in the atmosphere. So again, that's about perspective too, because it's not about, I want to go play the piano. I think truly your heart is saying, when I see the piano, my desire is that that piano release something into the atmosphere, what it can do, and, and that God will use me to help that piano to release the vibrations, because that's what you do. You hit lots of different vibrations, and those vibrations do something in the atmosphere that can cause people to stop, that can cause people to weep, that can cause people to have joy, that can cause people to fall down on their knees. And your desire is that you, God uses you to re help that piano release the vibration. So again, I'm gonna go back to what, as you were both talking, the first that came to me was, okay, you got the mantra, learn, practice, master, excel. Then guess what? The next one is poor. Mm. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Can I say something? <laughs> I can't take no more, please. Oh, this is good. I'm glad we can <laughs> take that. Mm -hmm. I gotta go Thank back you, and Lord. I gotta go back and watch it. Go ahead, uh, Bishop. <laughs> Elder John, Thank I love you, Pastor you. Jay. I love you too, sir. Uh, you know what I already said to you already. <laughs> we grew up together. We grew up together in the same church. We ate from the same bowl. Uh, execute. Execute. You are, you are always a man of influence. You always had a following of people. Now, it is time for you to execute. All the things that you have learned, the scripture, the singing, the impartation, now it is your season. Now it is time for you to execute. Don't look for folk to say yes and, you know, okay, pat you on the back. You know, that comes from unlikely places. But now, man of God, it is time for you to execute. Yeah. Man, I love you. Love you too, Doc. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all gonna make me cry on this thing in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Already said, 2020 is gone. This year is this year is the year of manifestation. Manifest. Manifest. Yeah. manifest. It's time to manifest. Yeah. Incubated in 2020, time to manifest. That's for all of us. Amen. Plenty of isolation. Time to get alone with God. Time to hear from God. Time to read. Okay. Well, now manifest. Execute. I got it. <laughs> thank you so much, Apostle. I, 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 you know, thank you so much for for your your you sharing that your perspective and Pastor Jay. Uh, my God, it's you know everything ties together. So I, I really, you know, it it's the fog, the smoke is cleared. <laughs> now I understand um, what was bothering me or what was missing. You know, because I was I had to get perspective and pouring and execution um, those three things you know that's I guess you just cleared it all up for me so thank you thank you so much I appreciate you all um, Apostle we got to steal you back we got to steal you back <laughs> at some point to come back um, because I you know I really and I'm sure the panel, everybody on here, you know, really value your um, your perspective on, you know, the word and God and, you know, meeting you for the first time. 
Well, let me shut up. Y'all say it. <laughs> I've been talking all night. <laughs> Bishop Kev, you got to come back too, Doc. Man, you know, I'm busy, so. I know, <laughs> I know you're busy. <laughs> We all pastors and leaders, and, you know, so, but I, I appreciate that this space will always be here because this is what the Lord said. So, um, you know, my intention is to continue, um, continue allowing God to, you know, use this platform uh, for those type of purposes. You know, it's powerful, it's impactful. Um, I'm excited, and um, this revelation I have tonight, I got to go back and watch this. I'm going to, you know, so I can really absorb <laughs> the many, many things that were shared on this platform tonight. So, on that note, um, any last words from anybody? Um, I don't want to keep anybody any longer. <laughs> any, any last? I enjoyed it immensely, and I, I, I'm really honored to be a part of this, and I feel very much blessed to have been a part of it. Amen. Pastor, well, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, even your personal details about, you know, your marriage and your deceased wife. Oh, no, no. We appreciate that. I, I do. Yeah. I appreciate that. Because I've been around some apostles and they, they ain't, <laughs> you, you never hear none of, nothing like that. They won't. Well, oh, yeah. I'll tell you this. You know, you know why? Because I do not jump on any social media or any kind of platform unless I know that this is what God wants me to do. Amen. And when God tells me to engage people in relationship, I can't expect them to be transparent with me mm. and have me speak into their lives if I'm not willing to be at the risk of being vulnerable, yeah. be transparent as well with them and have them speak into my life. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate I it. Transparency. Transparency helps us helps us well. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. um, it, it helps us. And I, I believe that um, your wisdom and um, your articulation of your purpose and and and, and, and what God has has um, what God has brought you through and what you are what you have experienced is helps us and that's where your transparency comes in it helps us to um, to glean from um, your teaching I think you taught us tonight even though you may not think that you know you taught us tonight and I think that we are Amen. At a better place, um, uh, as you you know, the word for um, Pastor John was perspective, as to the question that he asked, and he heard it. He heard you. <laughs> thank heard you. you. Thank uh, you. And so, we thank God for you because uh, you were sent to this platform for such a time as this, even in the midst of um, what we're going through, the challenges that we face as a ministry, as a church, um, you've helped us through some of the things tonight, even family and relationships, you've helped us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You ain't heard Jason Owen yet. <laughs> you, ain't heard, you, ain't, you ain't heard Owen yet. Um, <laughs> oh, so and just a tip, just a tip of the iceberg. That's okay. Um, man is I'm telling you. He's, he's coming back though. <laughs> well, we're wait, we're here. <laughs> Bishop Kev, thank you for being coming on tonight, man. I know I hit you last minute, but I I appreciate you, man, because you know, you know, like you said, we go way back, you know. <laughs> but, See, you, brother. Uh, 
and and <laughs> yeah, you know, I remember us walking to the store to buy some can buy candy, okay, <laughs> just candy. That's all we could afford sometimes. <laughs> but I appreciate you, man. We came, up, we came up through the struggle, but we're here by the grace of God. By the grace of God, man, and I appreciate you, man, for still being in my life, still calling me every now and again. Uh, not too, not too busy to to connect and i thank you thank god for that i thank you for that man i, I hit you at last minute so i appreciate your time man i really do Amen. pastor jay anything else just thank you apostle, um, apostle for being on with us tonight um also owen just um bringing forth and just um stirring us and just um just as Jean said so eloquently just laying some things out and just being transparent I was connecting with your story because I am the second wife of my husband, his first wife passed away. So as you were talking, I was connecting because he went through the same kind of thing in terms of the time and the frame and our story. It's one of those where, you know, God put together himself out. So I was just smiling when I was laughing about it with that. I connected with that. And I'm, I'm going to have to let my husband watch this so he can say, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Miss Carrington. Miss Carrington. <laughs> oh, Carrington. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Pastor Jay, thank my, you. And of course, my sisters and Kevin, I haven't seen for so long, but I was, but as soon as he said you were going to be on tonight, I was just looking forward to seeing your face. Good to see you. I remember those days walking the streets. You haven't lost anything. You're as lovely as ever, anointed still. That's Praise it. God. My sisters, as always, you know, we, we look forward to this evening. We really do. It is good for the soul. And it's, it's good to be stirred and it's good for iron to sharpen iron, especially in this dull world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Eldest, Elder Stacy, Lady P. Any last things? I just want to say uh, thank you, Apostle Owen, for the teaching, for the knowledge, and for being a, a, a willing vessel for God to even uh, to teach us or to, to be transparent to us on this evening. Yeah. Um, I pray that he continue to bless your comings and going. I pray that he continue to elevate you. I pray that... Uh, your heart continue to be open to receive what he has to give you because much more is to come. Uh, I pray that you also continue to be a willing vessel for him to use for you continue to pour out unto others and to go out into the masses of the four corners uh, to be obedient uh, to his will. Uh, so I just thank you for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Elder. Lady P. Hmm. <laughs> um, Apostle, I appreciate you. I appreciate your, um, I don't like to just repeat words, but I do appreciate your transparency. I appreciate you being a relevant person. And just listening to you tonight makes me think of the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. Uh, and I see you as a th as I see you as a thermostat, um, someone who controls where you are. And I appreciate your uh, being willing to just talk to us openly and just to remind us of our humanity yeah. and that we must take care of our humanity, cherish and value the people that we have in our lives, make sure that you know we don't just love them but we want them. That was good tonight, too. That was good. It was all good. And encouraging Pastor John, um, because I do know that the Lord has a mantle on his life, and he is he is a perfectionist, so he gets caught up in, you know, making sure everything is eyes are dotted and T's are crossed, and so I, under, I can relate to that, because Sorry. we get hung up there, and then the enemy can even hang us up there. Yeah. For so long that we don't really be, be released to go into. So I appreciate you, man of God. I, I hope that I get to see you in person one day because you're here in Georgia. Yeah, you will. You will. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. Want to carry his bag? 
Ah. Ah. His Bible. Carry his Bible. <laughs> Bring the prophet a cup of water. That's all I want to do. Pastor Jay, maybe one day when this is all over, with, we could take a road trip down there to see everybody. Hey, listen, or um, we could take a road trip up there. No, we're coming to Chicago. We're coming to Chicago. Come on. 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 Come on can um, relate to you in some way because, you know, I was married to a pastor for a very long time. I'm no longer in that position, but that's because we didn't understand our image in God, our identity, and so it got misplaced. And um, the church became the wife, and then I became the mother to the children, and things just got um, displaced, but... God's got you just like he's got me. All right? But we hang in there. God's not finished with us. Amen. No matter whose fault it is. That's right. That's right. Amen. Appreciate your prayers and your words. Pastor Kevin, I'm just wondering, why did it look like you were doing bird watching a minute ago? Yes. <laughs> bird watching? Are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, bird watching? I have some little photography equipment. Okay. I'm an amateur photographer, so I was cleaning some lenses at the same time. <laughs> I didn't even say I missed it. No. Yes. We're very observant, uh, Bishop Kevin. We're, we're very observant. Oh, <laughs> Attention to detail. Yes. He turned all the way around. He was just like, mm. yeah. Well, I, I don't want to belabor the point, so I appreciate all of you all again. Apostle, I can't say enough. I can't say enough. Um, but I'll be in touch with you, sir, or, you know, once you find out what your schedule is, you, you let me know, and um, we can definitely. definitely fellowship again, sir. Um, because this was just, um, I needed this. <laughs> and it was right, and I appreciate you. Bishop Kev, thank you, sir. Appreciate you all. Pastor Jay, as always, look forward to hearing from you. Minister Jean, we'll, we'll continue to pray for for um, your husband, um, the general, Floyd. <laughs> um, he's getting stronger and stronger, and we, we won't stop praying until, until. God, see healing. Until. So we appreciate you for being on. Um, keep, keep me posted. All right. I appreciate you. Praying for you as well. All right. Elder Stacy, thank you. Love you as usual. And Lady P, as always. You too, my brother. Call me. <laughs> I say it every week. And but that's what I'm saying. Why do we end with this? Um, can you please call him? Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Me. Jean, you too. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Apostle, um, can you close us up, sir? Um, can you close us out? And um, thank you again, sir. Um, we will be, t I'll be touching base with you. You're welcome. Lord God, we thank you for this you. refreshing time of sharing candidly, openly, transparently, giving us, oh God, a clear perspective concerning your prescribed identity for our lives. God, we pray that you'll bless each and every one of us, touch and continue to heal yes. our sister Jean's husband. Yes. Lord, continue to move by your spirit in all of our lives yes. and have your way and have the glory in our lives. Yes, we pray this in Jesus' name as we thank you, thank you Lord. for our elder John and Thank you, for Jesus. his availing himself yes. to bring us together in this manner. Thank we you, pray Lord. this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure. It was good. <laughs> this was good for us to be here.